Lord God, we, we thank you again for your wonderful word, for all that it reveals, Lord, that you are the master of history. Father, we thank you that for all the confidence and courage that brings us in this, uh, in this time especially. Lord, what a joy it is to know that, uh, Father, the world is never spinning out of control, not out of your control. So, Lord, we praise you for the comfort of this, this, uh, this message, the truth of the book of Daniel provides for us, and pray that we would be able to understand and apply it correctly to our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, everybody has, or at least uh, has a, a consciousness of these common dreams, right? Is it, is, I would love to do a show of hands and don't be embarrassed. How many of you had the flying dream where you're flying? You know, no, no flying. We've had some people who fly. How many of you had the chase dream where you're being pursued by someone? Yeah, you had the chasing dream, the falling dream. Yeah, I've had the falling dream a lot. You wake up. <laughs> How about the showing up to school or work in your underwear or less? You know, that the embarrass that no, I'm just not have had and not had that dream at all. Uh, but dreams can obviously be vivid, memorable, even expose how we're feeling about things in our lives. I don't mean anything goofy or mystical about that. I just mean if you're exhausted or stressed or you know feel spread too thin, it's obviously they're often going to reflect itself in your dreams. And you're like, oh, wow, I just had a terrible dream last night because I'm so wound up about this, that, or the other thing. It'd be a good indicator of what we need to cast upon the Lord. Um, uh, but Nebuchadnezzar had two atypical dreams, and they were vivid, chilling, and came straight from the Lord. And so we get this uh, exciting moment where the Lord again encounters Nebuchadnezzar through his dreams and through his, his dream life, and really is truly making sincere revelation of a sort to him. And uh, I say of a sort because uh, Nebuchadnezzar receives it, which is a rare honor as a Gentile to be one of the sources of revelation. There are Balaam and a couple others who had that honor, but um, <clears throat> even still, he was forced to or made to go to the Jewish people, specifically to Daniel in this case, in order to come to understand. And it shows one of the reasons why God uses or how God uses and reveals things in the Old Testament, particularly, is to bring people to a right relationship with him, which is a pretty important point to recognize that it's not enough that, um, that, that, that people even in the Old Testament believed there was a God or gods. They had to know the individual personal God, Yahweh, the God of Israel. That was an important requirement or expectation of them. And this is a super exciting, as we move into um, Daniel chapter 4, it's super exciting because we get, one, a fantastic literary device wherein uh, the narrative switches from being Daniel writing, seemingly, or perhaps a third person, Daniel writing as a, a third person, person disconnected um, author, to Nebuchadnezzar narrating the text. And so Nebuchadnezzar all of a sudden steps in. So this is just fun reading, right? You're not just getting, in fact, I would argue this isn't just a literary device. Quite to the contrary, it is actually something that Nebuchadnezzar wrote or um, a speech that he gave that Daniel's like, well, shoot, I could tell this story, but isn't it better from the, the man to whom it all occurred? So <clears throat> this is a really cool moment, right? And, and this was an announcement for everybody, right? Daniel had that special access given by his position, certainly that would possibly help him um, ascertain a copy of the message that he gave or the, the information that he gave. But this is uh, the Nebuchadnezzar making a speech and that being speech more or less being... Um, recorded in God's Word, which is pretty cool. This may have been as much as 30 years, uh, probably probably not quite that far, but it could be as much as 30 years after the events that we uh, studied in the last chapter about the fiery, fiery furnace and all that. So you want to realize that, as we talked about last week, a lot has probably gone on. And in fact, that 30 years is a long time to forget even an important encounter. And it's pretty amazing to me that it, who knows what encounters occurred between then in Nebuchadnezzar's personal life as the Lord pursued him. But as far as we know, it was just a return to business as usual, even after the big exciting moments and the revelation that occurred at the end of chapter 3, where Nebuchadnezzar makes a really you know, large, loud statement of belief in or some kind of faith in the Lord. 
specifically the God of the Bible. But I believe that this chapter that we'll be studying this week is um, Nebuchadnezzar's conversion experience. I think this is where it really all clicks for sure and for real. While he's made pretty uh, bombastic and amazing statements so far, it seems like this is that moment where he goes from believing in God to believing in the God of Scripture. Of course, he would have always been polytheistic and pagan, believing in many gods and uh, believing that just like any other source or, or, or power source around, that there would be more and less powerful ones. And maybe Daniel and his friends the, had this special access to a God who is, who is good or maybe even a little bit better. But he's now about to come to a realization, I believe uh, in the context of the next few weeks of study, a confession of the understanding of the absolute unique and special reality of the God of the universe. So uh, I think this is a very special account because we can't be absolutely uh, positive that uh, Nebuchadnezzar is saved and then we'll get to see him in heaven. But I think we have about as much information as we could have to come to that conclusion uh, with some confidence, and that's, that's exciting. It means that God worked on the heart of the most powerful leader in the world and uh, caring not just for the children of Israel, caring not just for the people who are enslaved or whose lives are difficult, but also caring even for the soul of the king, the pagan king, who is personally responsible for dispersing, at God's permission, of course, dispersing the children of Israel. So lots going on. We're going to look at these 18, first 18 verses in four sections. The first three verses we're going to look at is the introduction. Next, we're going to look at Daniel's qualifications and why he's uh, chosen, again, in the drama of the text. Then the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has will be outlined but not interpreted tonight. And finally, we get a recap statement from Nebuchadnezzar that I believe gives us a really clear picture of where we're at and hopefully springboard us and make us extra excited to show up next week. But let's start with those first three verses. It says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the, most sign, or the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. Now, this is pretty common fare. In fact, you could almost imagine this, uh, this set of verses showing up in the Psalms, couldn't you? Look, they're, they're very kind of familiar types of statements. But when we realize who it came from, we find out that something truly remarkable is coming along. You see, Nebuchadnezzar wants to tell everybody about this, not just his entire nation and not just the nations over which he now rules as an emperor after a fashion, but rather of all nations, all peoples, and all languages across the entire earth. And we're going to see how that uh, kind of plays into the context of what the Lord has revealed to him. But at the same time, we want to note that Nebuchadnezzar, in spite of all that he's been and the whole life that he's led, undoubtedly, repeatedly involved in pagan activity and certainly not recognizing fully and daily the, the God of the universe, the God of Israel, and yet now he wants to let everybody know. And the one who brought uh, war and conquest on this earth, right? Because that was his big thing. That was his claim to fame. He brought the war machine of Babylon around the ancient world and overtook and conquered many peoples. And now the one who brought war to the world is now proclaiming peace and wishes peace to the world. Boy, this must be some special message. It must be something really amazing that happened to this fellow that he would be proclaiming and wishing peace to even folks beyond the borders of his immediate reign, a thought previously un intolerable to him, right? In all of his self-admiration. Uh, self and yet we see, again, evidence of a change. Verse 2 continues on and says, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. So first of all, I thought it good. 
I thought it was the right thing to do. This is really an interesting point because it seems like he's appealing to a standard of righteousness outside of himself, outside of his own standard. I thought this was a good idea. It was the best for everyone. I thought this was something that everyone needed to hear. Now, it's really important in any leadership position to make sure that you're not kind of over-communicating or over-abusing the mic because people won't listen. And yet, this is something that he said, this is where I want to stop the world and make sure everyone knows that I've got a message to share. And that message has to do with the signs and the wonders. In fact, he wants to declare, he wants to preach, if you want to say that, the signs and the wonders of the Most High God. Indeed, God had done miraculous things, and there was evidence to Nebuchadnezzar that the God of Israel was able to do things that no other power, no other angel or demon or other spiritual force that he was connected to could do. God was unique in the demonstration of his power and authority. Nebuchadnezzar understood this as something that God did for him personally. He wants to tell them what God did, tell them what God did for him. It's a kind of an interesting thing, right? Why would he bother to share this? Is it that there is some uh, bragging? Like, hey, the God of the universe did this for me, so that makes me extra special. Is that something for him to brag about? I would suggest not. I would suggest that his interest in proclaiming this is that there's a, a reality to a right relationship with the God of the universe, and he wants them to know that as well. It reminds me of all of the passages of the New Testament, the constant uh, re reaction of everybody who comes to trust Christ and that desire to go and tell everybody what God has done for you, right? Jesus saying, go make disciples of all nations. I don't think they went, oh man, do we have to? They were thrilled at the opportunity to share what they had learned and our testimony is of a particular power. Sharing what the Lord has done for us can be one of the most amazing ways and terrific ways to generate interest in someone else in Christ. Because the clear application is, is what the Lord has done for us, truly, He could do for others as well. It doesn't mean that we'll all experience the same trials or joys or, or even the triumphs at the same time or at the same rate but when we understand the, great, the goodness of God and the love of Christ and his pursuit of us through the person of Jesus Christ, we can truly have an excitement, uh, an exciting thing to share. And the sad thing is for many of us, right, we maybe uh, trusted Christ at one point, maybe it was in our teenage years or otherwise, and maybe at that point we just had all this excitement, right, to share. We were so excited to share because we knew we were forgiven. We knew that we were whole. We knew that we were going to go to heaven. We knew that we were in a relationship with the God who loves us. We could know him personally and how excited we were. And then over the years, maybe through rejection or people saying, ah, you're crazy, Maybe through the conflicts that come when you do teach and talk about the truth and share about the gospel of Jesus Christ that you never expect. Here, I'm coming with the best news you could ever hear, and people get mad at me for talking about it. It's the craziest thing in the world, isn't it? If you were giving away $100 bills, you wouldn't have this problem, even if people didn't think they were real $100 bills. Which, by the way, if you are distributing tracks and giving those fake $100 bills away, please stop. That's so disappointing to people. <laughs> it shouldn't be, but it's just, I mean, give them a real track. That's all. Anyway, the point being, if you had at any other service or opportunity to offer someone something that they need or that they would benefit from, it's amazing to think that this would become a point of conflict. And yet it does, because people who are... Uh, rebellious against God, hate the light. And even though you don't have to clean up to come to God, they prefer their own sinful ways or they prefer to be God of their own life and they sense what that means, not realizing what's going on. And so those experiences pile up and sometimes make us a little bit up, uh, uh, hesitant to share in the future. We're going, I'm, I don't want to just upset people. I don't want to make people mad. So maybe I'll hold off. But when we think about how wonderful what God's given us is, we really cannot but or cannot help but talk about it. 
even if we're just talking about it in the context of our lives. You see, John 3.16 is a great and easy way to understand what God's done for us. First of all, for God so loved the world. God's motivation is not a desire to punish. In fact, he takes no pleasure in the punishment of the wicked. He is desirous that every person would come to salvation in Christ Jesus because he loves us both as a group and as individuals. And this reality of not understanding the love of God is exactly what causes people to flee from him because they know that they're worthy of nothing but his wrath and judgment. And yet that's exactly why the next statement is so important. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave up his own son, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, eternal God, very God of very God, who became 100% human in order to rescue us. If we're going to be very clear about this, he gave up his only begotten son when he went to the cross, when Jesus Christ went to the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. That's how we know that we are not saved by a capricious God who chooses at one point to save a person or selects a person and saves them for a time, but then changes his mind because something happens or, or whatever it is. But rather, we serve a God whose love is so perfect and pure that he provides a permanent salvation for anyone who would trust in him. He will never change his mind because that payment was made in full and with a full knowledge of all things that would come to pass, even our future failures. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's God's provision. That whoever believes in him this is the simple response. It isn't come to church or get baptized with our water. It isn't take our special magical communion cracker or give a certain amount of money or give everything that you own. It is not any work of man. It is absolutely by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. And that reality is, is that anyone who comes to understand the gospel correctly should say, at least for a moment, isn't that too good to be true? Isn't that too easy? If God's going to love me, don't I have to be perfect? And we say, yeah, that's right. You'll never be perfect, no matter how hard you try. But God and his son has provided for you forgiveness and put you in his, or positioned every believer in his son so that we have his perfection, his imputed righteousness rather than our own. Received by faith alone and nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. Simply trusting, daring to believe that God is loving, as he declared, powerful and desirous to provide salvation, and being willing to trust in that payment for our sin. By faith alone, the thing that we could never achieve or earn for ourselves given freely while he takes the punishment that we could never bear in its completion, saving us from the hell that we deserve into the heaven that we could never earn or deserve. And that whoever does believe in him should not perish. That now we are a part of God's eternal keeping. Once you have trusted in Jesus Christ, you are there in eternity, in future, set and settled free and completely secure in that. The Greek is emphatic. You will not perish, not ever perish, no matter whether that's something that you would do or something that any other force would do or anything that would happen to you. The keeping is God's responsibility, and he takes that responsibility for us. How amazing is that? How good is the good news of the gospel? And it goes even further to say that we should have everlasting life, not as a future problem, but as a present possession, that the one who trusts Christ is now in possession of everlasting or eternal life, life unending, the eternal quality of life. It's not something that comes uh, in the future. It's something that the believer has and has access to right now in every single moment. We've got great news to share. You're not pressuring people to join your church or give money to you, or your political organization. You're not giving uh, people, you know, sort of veiled promises of, well, you know, if you believe and take this salvation, but also you sure got to X, Y, and Z. You got to go to work hard in the back end. Nope. 
you have an offer, a message of the God who loved every person on this planet and went to the cross to save every person who would believe. Can you imagine that? We have great news. And so Nebuchadnezzar, being in many effects the greatest king the world had ever known in his time, chose to use his uh, platform as a pulpit to point people towards God. This is not as a young, rash man. This is an older, uh, seasoned, and successful king. But we're going to go a step further and say it's super weird. And we can see why a lot of politicians, in fact, uh, most every politician in America claims to be a Christian in, in some sense, right? Uh, I've not heard of a single politician that doesn't claim to have read the Bible and ascribe to Christian principles at the very least, and most will outward claim to be a Christian of some kind, and I hope they are saved. I hope they know the Lord for certain. But you can see there's a lot of political reason with how many folks identify as Christians in America. There's a lot of political reason because, rightfully so, we don't trust atheists. <laughs> None of us do. Even atheists don't, maybe especially atheists don't. Because there's no, nothing holding them to any kind of a moral compass, and that is the absolute reality. And we realize that. We don't trust people. So even atheists kind of keep it under their hat if they're in political office. So it's not uncommon for a political leader to make a, uh, a play for some sort of religious sense of authenticity, but this is totally the opposite thing. One, Nebuchadnezzar was not coming up for re-election. And two, with all of his obsession with himself, his power, his empire, and his pride, this is a weird story to tell for those of you who already know it. For those of you who don't, go back and or go you know, read through tonight and, and get a bigger picture of what goes on. But this is an amazing thing. This greatest king on earth, this one who celebrates his own power, and by the way, Kings like this did get deposed, right? They were overtaken by their enemies or, or perhaps uh, by some coup from within. He wasn't impregnable in his, his position. And so showing weakness in the way of telling this story publicly was quite a remarkable statement. I think it brings us to an understanding of the power of humility. For me, there's this constant um, parallel between the captivity in Egypt, or the, the children of Israel being slaves in Egypt, and the Babylonian captivity. And the way Pharaoh reacted, well, in many ways similar to, um, to how uh, Nebuchadnezzar um, reacted, has some stark differences. Exodus 10.3 says, Now Moses and Aaron, so Moses and Aaron came into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. What is God calling Pharaoh to do? To humble himself before the Lord. And that's exactly what Pharaoh refused to do, and that's exactly why the uh, terrible plagues were poured out and continued to be poured out upon Egypt because Pharaoh refused to humble himself before the creator God of the universe. Psalm 18.27 continues this same theme. It says, For you will save, you God, will save the humble people, but will bring down haughty looks. That here, I believe that the psalmist was undoubtedly not talking about eternal spiritual salvation, but rather talking about the Lord's deliverance from difficult circumstances. And nevertheless, there's this connection between the person who is willing to humble themselves before the Lord and the Lord's intervention on your behalf. Additionally, Proverbs 11.2, speaking many times about the issue of humility, says, when pride comes, then comes shame, but with the humble is wisdom. So here, really hand in hand with the repeated statement that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, also states that humility is, the, uh, is, is part and parcel to or the background needed for wisdom. Well, those, those three statements go well in hand, don't they? To be humble, to humble yourself before the Lord, is to fear the Lord. Fear of the Lord is not a phobic terror by any stretch of the imagination. The fear of the Lord is understanding how great He is, how much beyond our scope and capacity to understand and certainly to manipulate or control in any way, and to recognize how small we are and how subject to every circumstance and every change. 
I mean, it takes just a few moments apart from oxygen to extinguish a human life. A few days away from water, a few weeks away from food. We're so dependent upon our environment simply to continue existing in this physical world. And yet God is dependent upon nothing for his continued existence. He is alone, self-existent. And so when we understand the difference between what we are and understand ourselves to be and what God is, it is a grossly unbelievable reality or maybe an incomprehensible reality. And yet it's the truth. And it seems one of the things that God de desires most from man is for us to understand how amazing, how great he is, how small we are, so we can appreciate how much he's loved us. James 4.10 likewise says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. I think what we see in this case is a shocking humility from Nebuchadnezzar. He's going to tell a story that absolutely is at his own expense. The, he's the butt of the joke here. He's the butt of God's joke. He's been overpowered. Uh, any given king of this age would want to, his people to know that he could manipulate the gods or, or work, or at least had the strongest God on his side, and maybe that's part and parcel of this discussion. But we see that this humility before the Lord is what makes this such a powerful moment. It's amazing that the most powerful world man on earth at this time is brought to the place of proclaiming the awesome might and power of a foreign God, of the God of Israel. God alone, of course, is the only one who's worthy of our praise and adoration. It's what we are designed to do, what we're built to do, and it's why we spend so much time singing and praying together. We're not just here to entertain one another, although certainly the, the words and songs of praise bring encouragement to our hearts as well as we encourage one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, but also it is the right thing for us to be doing at any given time to be bringing glory to God actively, corporately through our songs of praise. You see, when we gather together to sing God's praises, we're doing the important work of eternity together. And this is why it sickens me when you hear about people choosing their church based upon the style of music that is used there. Because it suggests that we're all singing for your pleasure. And you want to find the way that fits you and your tastes. Now, again, I don't want to, uh, you know... Uh, over simplify a complicated discussion. I recognize that there's a lot to it. But if our real desire and design is to bring glory to God, as Nebuchadnezzar does here, are we really going to be that concerned with the trappings? Are we going to be concerned with the, the content of what we're saying and overjoyed with the reality that we're united together with the saints of God and able to sing and cry out in praise that reminding both ourselves and Him that we know that He is great, mighty, loving, gracious, merciful, kind, that He is the hope of our lives in every day and every trial and every situation. We were built to worship. And so, when we come together to sing a song, it is an opportunity not to be bashful about your voice because I'm just so embarrassed to sing. God made your voice. He knows it stinks. And just like a parent, he wants to hear it because he loves you. I'm just kidding. You all sing beautifully. But the, the reality is that it's not about you. It's finally an opportunity to get together with the other, the people of God and rem remember together that your life's not all about you and what entertains you and what makes you happy and achieving your goals or your hopes, your desires for personal success. You finally get to stand around and sing these great songs of the faith from every time and every era and declare that it's all about the glory of God. It's all about the glory of Christ. It's all about the message of who He is and how much He loves us and has done for us again to His glory. And that's why it is truly worship when we gather together and learn from the Word. Because we finally say, I'm going to set aside what I think, Lord, and I'm going to try to replace it with what you think. 
That's why we are a church that gets together and opens the Word of God together because it doesn't matter what any person thinks. It matters what God thinks. And one day, everyone will join us in this. Will you please join me in reading Philippians 2, 9 through 11? And therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. I love how this, in a way, the sim these simple verses summarize all the eschatology that we could spend months and years studying. In the end, everyone will bow the knee and glorify Christ, willingly or unwillingly, wherever they're at, because he will be shown to be the very God of very God, the Savior of the earth, the one just, true, righteous, and holy King. That's exciting. It's exciting that you're in that right relationship with him now. And it's exciting that the only way you could be in that relationship is because he provided that way for you in his sacrifice in Jesus Christ. How wonderful. That should lighten us every single day. And yet we're so much victim to being stuck in time. Eternal realities sometimes can feel like, oh yeah, I know that. Yeah, I've got that in mind which means we have to take time to remember, as Peter says, stirring up your mind, to remember how great God is, to remember how amazing your salvation is. You see, every time you open your Bible, you may learn something new. I hope we do about God, about his plan, about his son, about his love, about what he desires for us. But it's just as important that we're reminded of the things that we already knew. And this wonderful realization is worth our note at every moment. We see here that King Nebuchadnezzar is uh, enamored with, or at least going to proclaim, the many signs and wonders of the God of Israel. Now, we don't know how much research he'd done at this point. Certainly, he could have uh, known that God was the God of creation, bringing everything into being out of nothing. Creation ex nihilo, as it's called. We could know that, or he could know surely, that this was the same God that flooded the universe, flooded the earth in judgment at one point, calling down and bringing up the very reality of the power of water to destroy the entire world and save only eight. Certainly, he could have or had opportunity to hear about God's faithfulness to the Jewish people through the miracles and judgments of the Exodus and one wonders given the fact that Daniel had such access to him, that he wasn't mindful of the fact that this God who had done so much for, uh, in front of him, and, and now very particularly to him, had a track record of breaking the backs of proud kings. And I wonder if he, based upon that historical re reference, perhaps decided to take a wiser tack. But even then, in his own life, he'd seen the miracle of God preserving his people. Uh, that is to say, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel being uh, healthier than everybody else in spite of their uh, vegetarian diet. It sounds like a joke every time I say it, but I legitimately believe that's an, excellent, that's an amazing miracle. Um, but also his, uh, God's miraculous preservation of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, God's miraculous revelation, not just of the meaning of his dream of the statue, but also being able to reveal that, something that happened in his head some time ago, that Daniel would be able to know it shows a really remarkable relationship with God, which in each instance Nebuchadnezzar noticed. And so his signs and wonders were certainly known, and this is no different. In fact, this is the, the big sign or wonder uh, that, interestingly, probably had the least impact on the rest of the kingdom and yet had the most impact on Nebuchadnezzar's own personal faith. And then he says something truly shocking. He says that his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. That's quite a statement. You see, we have been taking that word kingdom non-literally in the church for so long that we just let that, those statements like that 
float along like a piece of rubbish down the river. Oh, yeah, kingdom, everlasting kingdom, whatever that means. Woo, it's the kingdom of God, we're here. And because we take it to mean just about anything, it is ultimately meaningless to us. All right, talking about the kingdom of God as the church is pathetic. It's heartbreaking. And so for Nebuchadnezzar to make a statement like this just fits in with all the, you know, half-calf, milk-toast Christianity that exists across, you know, the, the pop Christian music and the T-shirts of our day. But, I mean, when Nebuchadnezzar said that his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, he wasn't just recognizing even the universal lordship of God or kingship of God the Father, but I think he's submitting himself to what God had revealed to him. Remember when we look back on chapter 2 and 3? He got that vision from God of the statue that declared both the end of his reign and the end of all human reign, all of human reign in favor of the kingdom of God. And then he responded by defying God, putting up his own statue that was made or covered, plated in gold from head to toe. He was essentially saying to God, nah, -uh, my kingdom, Babylon, this greatest kingdom of the world, will last forever. Pay attention, America. It didn't. And then the stone cut without hands comes and destroys the empires of men and grows into a huge mountain. Now think about the distinction in that picture that we got to look at in the past weeks, the distinction between this big, beautiful, man-made idol compared to the immovable mountain that appeared behind it, constantly growing, ever growing, ever becoming bigger. The solidity, the trustworthiness, the strength of that coming kingdom was unlike any other. And Nebuchadnezzar finally recognizes, because God makes him recognize, breaking his pride, recognizes that this new kingdom that's coming, it will be real, it will be literal, it will be physical, and it will be unending. One can only wonder if he came to know the covenants of God, the Abrahamic covenant, Abrahamic covenant contained in Genesis 12 and then elucidated in 15 and 17 of the, uh, Genesis. And then the three supporting covenants that came, the Palestinian covenant that covered the land promise, the Davidic covenant that covered the seed promise, the messianic promise, and the new covenant that covered the blessing promise, all yet to be fulfilled in that messianic kingdom, that time without end. The covenants make it clear, and they are not yet fulfilled as they were given. We are still awaiting that. We see how he has prepared to feel. We've seen how he's been faithful in it. But that kingdom that is ahead is something truly remarkable and yet unseen on the earth. The scope of that kingdom is limitless. There is going to be no nation, city, corner, or station that is not under the direct rule of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, in that time. Surely a dream for every single empire-building megalomaniac that's ever walked this earth, including the Antichrist, who will experience the closest to that that anyone ever has, and still fall wretchedly short. The scope of the kingdom is that limitless reality, the eternality of the kingdom, in that that thousand years that Christ reigns on earth is simply the front porch to the great eternal reign in the new heavens and the new earth. And it all revolves and centers around the king of that kingdom, the stone cut without hands, something eternal, someone eternal, the second person of the Trinity. And I hope if you would like to turn with me to uh, Isaiah chapter 11, I'm going to read 12 verses out of this to descri that describe that king in that time. And I want you to let these words resonate in your ears. It says, there shall be come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and for the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not 
judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor. He shall decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with his rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf will shall also shall lay, dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf of the and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze together. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand into the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who were left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam to Shinar, to the, from Hamath to the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and will gather together dispersed from Judah and from the four corners of the earth. You hear the excitement in Isaiah's pen as he writes these words. This is the future that you've been promised. This is the future that we look forward to. This is the future wherein every tear will be wiped away and every hurt will be healed. This is the future hope for every believer. And Nebuchadnezzar, this pagan king who defied God openly, has now come to rest in this reality that his future was that is without end. His future kingdom is without end. Furthermore, his dominion is unchallengeable. The authority of God, he recognizes, is unlimited. The Father has, is on his throne right now. Though history would show that the Medo-Persians would be next, the Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire, and now all the mess of time that's happened between then and now, God is still the one who's in control just as he was in Daniel's time. And it might be an apropos lesson for our world now. As we look forward to an election very near, might I remind you that no matter who wins, God is still in control. You don't need to doubt that for a moment. In fact, he's no less in control now over our ridiculous voting society than he was then over their ridiculous monarchies of people who could just seize power whatever way they did. He's still in control. There's still no dominion, no power that can oppose him and his express will. So now we move on to Daniel's qualifications with four through nine. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and was flourishing in my palace, and I saw a dream which made me afraid. And the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream, but they did not make known, the dream, uh, known to me its interpretation. But at last Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. In him is the spirit of the holy God. And I told him the dream before him, saying, Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you, and no secret troubles you, explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen and its interpretation. So, the king has a nightmare. The king has a scary dream. This time of year in particular, we talk and think about nightmares and things that creep out of them with some frequency. But the king is admitting that this dream troubled him greatly, that it really upset him. And he has preference for this. The Lord uses dreams and has used dreams in his past to reveal important things to Nebuchadnezzar, and this would be just one of those occasions. We also note that he repeats his same old pattern. The king goes through all the usual channels. He has this troubled dream. He calls together all of his wise men and astrologers and sorcerers and everyone to try to give him an a, a interpretation. And yet... Here, uh, we see the same result. 
And perhaps in the time between the statue incident and now, he just let the God of Israel slip to the back of his mind. I don't know. You'd think you'd jump right to the guy who got it done the first time, right? Like, I mean, imagine if you go through, you know, 47 housing contractors to get the job done, you might call the guy that finished it first, but he doesn't do that. Maybe he was trying to exhaust all other possibilities before humbling himself before Daniel's God one last time. But it kind of reminds me of a quote that, uh, of Corey Ten Boom. She said, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? It's interesting that he had someone who he knew who had been miraculously proven to be someone who had the ear of God or some access to, to, to aid God that Nebuchadnezzar didn't understand. And yet he still seems to want to save that for last. But finally, we come to Daniel, and we get an interesting introduction. You see, Daniel is known here by his Hebrew name, but then is also given his Babylonian name because he's named for the god, uh, pagan god Bel, or been renamed for that. Now, if you have a New King James Version, then you will have something to the effect of the spirit of the holy god, which suggests that Nebuchadnezzar is, uh, is at this time of, that he's narrating, already uh, something of a believer. However, the Hebrew would read far more. In fact, every other major translation will treat this a spirit of the holy gods. So he thinks of Daniel as being having a special connection or some kind of uh, relationship or perhaps even a possession by a spirit of the holy gods, perhaps thinking like the good gods versus the bad gods in some kind of pantheon. So Again, while it's, uh, you know, we, we appreciate, especially the New King James, the beauty of the translation and the reverence that it has, there are some times where it seems to, you know, move in the favor of some kind of, uh, of um, stronger understanding than Nebuchadnezzar at least communicates in the Aramaic here. So, um, <clears throat> we want to note here the nature of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and what Nebuchadnezzar or Daniel would have understood. See, we see uh, Genesis 1-2, it says, The earth was without form and void, and the darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit of God, was well known in the Old Testament as different in person, but united in essence to God the Father. And in the act of creation, all three members of the Trinity are present and active, and what the uh, Holy Spirit is doing seems to be energizing that whole thing. That idea of hovering over the face of the deep has almost a sense of, of vibrating, of empowering, of energizing creation. So the Holy Spirit is a part of the, the Bible from the very, very beginning. Exodus 31.3 says, And I, have I, God the Father speaking, have filled him with the Spirit of God. Again, the Ruach HaKodesh, the, or the Holy Spirit in view in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. Here he's talking about the Holy Spirit is going to come on a specific workman in the creation of the, temp, uh, the tabernacle and its artifacts. He's saying that the Holy Spirit is going to come upon a laborer, a tradesman, in order to equip him for this task of building that most holy tabernacle. And it gives us a clear picture of how the Holy Spirit was operating in the Old Testament. He would appear and, and kind of descend upon a person, enabling them to a very specific task, something as simple as building the effects for the tabernacle or something as great as speaking the word of God, as with Balaam. Numbers 24.2 says, And Balaam raised his eyes, of course, a, 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 a non-Gentile a prophet, and saw Israel encamped according to the tribes, and the Spirit of God came upon him. Even though he wasn't perfectly obedient to God, in fact, became quite a canker in the lives of the, of the Israelites, he raised his eyes, and the Holy Spirit of God came upon him. For what? For the purpose of revealing God's word and God's revelation. 1 Samuel 11, 6 says, And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard this news. Well, that's weird. Saul's the bad guy, right? He well, becomes the bad guy pretty quick. And yet that did not stop the Holy Spirit from coming upon him when he was in right relationship with him. And his anger was greatly aroused. So the Holy Spirit of God, we could come to many other examples, uh, Samson being a, a very easy one to see. The Holy Spirit of God comes upon him, and he goes and does a miraculous feat of strength, Herculean proportions. Uh, Psalm 51.11 gives us a perfect picture from the uh, lips of David after he had 
undergone one of his greatest sins and fail, moral failures. He says, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. David was not worried for one moment that the shepherd of his soul, the good shepherd, would ever abandon him to hell in an eternity apart from him. But he did know that the nature of the way the Holy Spirit operated is that he would be or could be revoked if you were unlicensed or delicensed for a specific purpose or office. So he prays rightly and genuinely for the Lord in light of his sin to not remove the Holy Spirit's anointing from him as king. This is entirely distinct from the way the Holy Spirit acts with the church. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. You see, there's a very different reality. Every person who hears the word of truth, hears that gospel that we discussed tonight, and believes it is now permanently indwelt and sealed with the Holy Spirit as a settled state for the rest of their life and eternity. It's a different relationship to the Holy Spirit. Likewise, Romans 8, 14 through 17 says, For as many are as led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again unto fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, then join heirs with Christ. If, we do, and if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. Isn't that great? The Holy Spirit is a permanent part of your life, and we frequently break up his ministries rightly into non-experiential and experiential, the ones you can feel and encounter and the ones that you don't. His non-experiential ministries are positional in nature. When you trust in Jesus Christ, you are regenerated. You're moved from death to life. That is a work of the Holy Spirit, according to the book of Titus. You've been dwelt by the Holy Spirit. He takes up residences within you. He's not going away and coming back or fleeing and returning based upon how well you do that day. He is a current resident in your spirit, in your soul. Next, baptizing, immersing you. Immersing you in Christ Jesus is the work of the Holy Spirit, a permanent change, and sealing you, that idea of being permanently sealed for the purposes of him who sealed you. The Holy Spirit has done all that the moment you believed. But we go on to the experiential ministries where he comforts, teaches, assures, guides, intercedes, and convicts. The Holy Spirit operates differently. And that's, uh, this is one of the great examples of, uh, of that, of how, it, how he operated in the Old Testament in Daniel's ministry. He came upon him in order to provide these um, interpretations. And Daniel was one of those special believers who was so righteous that he might have been the unique Old Testament believer who had just a continual anointing of the Holy Spirit, much like uh, the, other, the prophets and the priests that were chosen by God. Uh, well, the king asked Daniel to explain the dream and his interpretation. It's interesting that he doesn't go through or drag Daniel through the steps of getting the content of the dream from the Lord. This could be a baby step in Nebuchadnezzar's faith, maybe. I'm not going to take you through that again. I know that what your God tells you will be true and will be the right interpretation. And then he begins telling him about the dream. <clears throat> we are, we'll uh, read through 10 through 17 very briefly. It says, and these were the visions in my head while on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and it was, a, uh, and it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The, bird of the birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and cut off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leaves, uh, leave the stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, and let the tender grass grow of, of the field 
in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beasts of the earth, of the uh, grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast, and let seven times pass over him. This decision is by decree of the watchers and the sentence of the word of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever he will, and sets over it the lowest of men. All right, let's pause there at verse 17. We see here the vision that he's taking. Now, we're going to do, I'm going to do the hardest thing that I maybe ever have to do as a pastor. We're going to go through this and not tell you what it all means because that's next week's message. And yet, I would like for us to take a moment to go through sort of an exercise of understanding or imagining, and since, you know, some of you are half asleep already, right? Like, just just stay in that dreamlike state and uh, imagine what it would be like to experience that in the, the hazy dream world where you know that certain things feel like they're of extreme importance, but you just don't understand it. And certain small details seem just to beguile you with the inability to, to understand it. So he starts off by dreaming of a tree. He sees a tree in the earth. Now, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, so I always imagined that this was a big, tall, evergreen tree because that's most of what we had. And Eleanor's nodding. That's right. Yep. But it probably wasn't. That probably wasn't the tree that um, Nebuchadnezzar would have thought of. Probably uh, more of a of like a large um, willow tree, or or perhaps a cedar tree of some kind. Uh, again, a branchy, leafy type of tree. Even more made even more clear by the fact that we see that it has fruits, a fruit of some kind. Nevertheless, it grows and becomes strong. It becomes so big that it touches the heavens. It's interfering with the cloud coverage as it passes by, and it is so great that it can be seen at the very ends of the earth. Now, of course, there's this is a dream, right? Not a reality, but obviously this huge uh, perception that you could see it, you know, sitting in on the far corner of Spain or on the far corner of Japan, right? You could see this growing in the in the Middle East. It's kind of the the picture, if you want to imagine, how huge, how dwarfing this gigantic tree must have been. Just absolutely kind of beyond understanding. And in verse 12, uh, we see everything about this tree is healthy and life-giving, wonderful, healthy leaves, abundant fruit falling, and it's a haven for both birds and beasts alike. It's, it's this beautiful pastoral image, the, the gorgeous nature of it all, of the animals and the trees all getting along and the fruitful, healthy huge tree that's just amazing to see. If, if you've ever seen the, the redwoods in California, you've seen a truly a gigantic tree, right? You can hopefully appreciate at least a little bit. And then something comes in and interferes. It's one of the watchers. Now, this is actually one of the most frequent terms for a celestial being, or what we'd often call angels, outside of the biblical literature. That is to say, in the Bible, we only have a couple instances of calling it, the, but if you get into like the book of Enoch and the book of Jubilees, they're most frequently called watchers. It's the, kind of their frequent point uh, or, or point of origin. It actually gives us a, a good, healthy reason to question whether or not those extra biblical books, and very severely, are authentic is because, interestingly, they take language that is peculiar to the, inter or, you know, to the, the late uh, biblical period of the the Persian period, uh, and and um, reproduce it. So it's just an interesting little side note for that. But it's used once in Job seven twenty of God Himself, uh, oh, the great Watcher of men, and the other two instances are here in this chapter. And yet the idea of calling the angels watchers shows us something about what their function and purpose is. You see, we know that the word angel means messenger, and that is one of their purposes. They serve as messengers to relay God's word or God's message to humans or to people. But here also we see that the angels are watching or spectating what God is doing, and that's an interesting thing all by itself. They are learning about God's character, about God's plan, about who God is, just as we are, maybe not in the same way or at the same rate, but they're learning about God's character just as we are through the revelation of time. This angelic being gives the order to have the tree removed, chopped down, stripped leaves, scattered fruit. Now remember the size of the tree. What an amazing thing it would be that a tree that was so large that it touched the heavens would be chopped down and fall to the ground. Can you imagine the sound of the crash 
that it would make, chopped down and stripped out, completely humiliated and removed from its place of prominence. The expulsion of beasts and birds are an indication that it no longer has the influence over the living that it once enjoyed. And this humiliation continues as the stump is left alone and kept from growing by a metal band, right, to keep from growing back. The pronouns here turn from it, as you would refer to a tree, to he and him, right? They turn to masculine singular pronouns, which is our first little hint that this tree is not a nation, but is or represents an individual. That the man's heart, which is volition, emotions, and will, all wrapped into one, are going to be changed from that of a man to the, that of an animal. He's going to lose his, this, whoever this is, is going to lose his mentality. And seven times, or years, are going to pass over him in this time. And this is all said to be a divine sentence. Now, we were not going to spend a great deal of time uh, in discussion of this, but it appears that this is a reference to the divine counsel, that just as God seems to be working in coordination with the wills that he created in humans, he's also working in coordination with a certain number of angelic representatives. This is what we see um, exemplified in the early chapters of Job. All of the sons of God come together, and it seems like there is some purpose in that gathering. And it's amazing for us to think, because we like to think of like, oh, our little fussy busyness on earth is one thing, but then, you know, once you get past that, it's just kind of all uniform God's will. But what we see is that the Lord is actually coordinating many wills off and against one another. And it helps us understand the nature of the angelic conflict as well, that there was some rebellion at some point that continues and persists to this day in the angelic realm. So, this uh, council of angels seems to be the ones who are, sat, are, are um, you know, in approval of and in execution of this decision. Just as the Lord allows the will of men to shape his creation, so the will of these watchers is also a part of that complex equation of reality. But it is God Most High who rules over the decisions and actions of these angelic watchers. God is the final authority. He is other than them. He is different from them. He is not one of them or even the strongest one of them. He is the eternal God who stands outside even of their spheres of authority and influence. And despite godlessness of men, God is still the one who appoints people and allows them their sanity or takes it away. Isn't that something remarkable? Sometimes I wonder if he's going to give it back to our president. Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, like the rivers of water. He turns it wherever he wishes. Ooh, we get one of, the, one of those, and no one's going to be able to sleep. All right, so recap Daniel uh, 4.18, our final verse, with very little to say because it really is a recap. It says, this dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, declare my, its interpretation, since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation. But you are able, for the Spirit of the Holy God is on you. So again, we see this Spirit of the Holy God is on you language. Um, this is actually a little bit more hopeful in how it comes across. It seems that this would lend itself more naturally to what we'd like to see, I guess, if we wanted to see him uh, confessing God. But remember, this is still before the trial, before the dream came to light. And so we can't assume that if, if his big moment of change was after this, the things that he would say before it would be just such as this in, in, in light of his own worldview. The king knows that this dream is ominous and, and important. And he repeats the fact that his wise men are unable to give the interpretation. I wonder if they'd have the courage to give it even if they could. Like Nebuchadnezzar, we should all, I hope, be ready to tell the world about what the Lord has done for us. Even if that is and it does, humbles us and makes him great before the world. God is truly sovereign over all human history. He's able to take away the very sanity from any person that he wishes. He's able to influence those he wishes to influence and break and destroy those he needs to break and destroy. His will will be done on this earth, and you never need to fret for so much as a moment. God's plan to bring himself glory is underway. It's not up for debate. It's not in question. And regardless of what happens in our day-to-day -day or the management of our country, our world. 
we can always rest secure that ultimately everything will work together to bring glory to the God who created all. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the assurance that your word brings us. Your plan is underway. Lord, you are preparing and allowing the world's forces and the enemy's forces to prepare and draw lines and move forward. We know that this ends with your glory. And Lord, you're sharing that glory with all who trust in you and are in a right relationship with you. Please, O oh Lord, in this time, however much remains, might we not be distracted by the things of this world, by the movements of the great powers and people, but simply seeking to follow after the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to make him known wherever we might be called for the few days that we share on this planet, knowing the future and the glory that is ahead for us. In Christ's name we pray, amen.